All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Will Robinson. I'm the head of Acceleration at Alliance. My title is pretty confusing, so I'll tell you what I do and who I am. Um, I've been at this DAO for a year now. Uh, we're considered one of the leading Web3 accelerators in space. Uh, we focus on games and DeFi and DAO tooling and blockchain infrastructure. Uh, and we look for founders at early stages uh, and help them out for free. Um, and our goal is to build um, the world's best uh, Web3 community. And we use the accelerator as this Ellis Island, this like customs gate bridge to get people into our new transnational nation of uh, Web3 Illuminati builders, founders. Uh, I've been there for years. I mentioned before that I was a forensic crypto auditor for about four years, uh, helping uh, Grant Thornton do its audit of a variety of exchanges and foundations and Cayman Island accounts across the world. My background is a PhD in video game design. Uh, I studied and made games for about 10 years uh, and now live at the intersection of games and crypto. My uh, primary focus uh, today is to talk about composability in Web3 games. Uh, so we're going to cover some key terms today, uh, and then we'll have time for questions. And the, the hope is that uh, we can get to some common language and think about why we would want to make games in crypto anyway. So here we go. Uh, a common word you hear is interoperable. Um, and that's about sharing data. So when something is interoperable with something else, it's because they can share information. Um, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, composable, that's when you share logic. It's something a little more interesting and a little rarer in video games uh, in the normal Web 2 world because of the walled gardens. So like, for instance, in Dota, uh, my entire stats history uh, playing that game is available to the public. But the logic of Dota is not. Um, you can't just like build on top of Dota itself. Um, permissionless. So sharing with anyone. That means that the idea here uh, is that on a blockchain, the logic is available in uh, a sort of unguarded way. It's public logic, and so you can sort of trigger it. Uh, now, there are ways to, to gate and access within a chain itself, but if you don't like that gating, you can usually just fork and then uh, use the ungated version of the contract. Uh, and then uncensorable, so sharing forever. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, there's going to be this sense that people can block or stop or prevent uh, you from using the data and the logic that you're previously having access to. But theoretically, if you do this right, um, it shouldn't be stoppable. Um, and so we're going to go into that now. So interoperable, um, for example, tokens. So smart contracts can use mappings to connect addresses to balances or to uniform resource identifiers. So if you hold a token, like let's say USDC, basically what it looks like in that contract is a mapping of a whole bunch of addresses, including yours. And at that address, there's some balance, which is just a number. So either you have 100 USDC or your zero USDC or 0 0.1245 USDC, there's just a number at that address. And that contract is there to manage your ability to spend that address. Um, and basically every other smart contract or Web2 app can query that contract's mapping. Usually there's like an explicit get function. It's like get address balance. Um, and so here's a screenshot from Zapper. What Zapper does um, is it looks at uh, an address. In this case, you can see mine, um, or one of mine anyway, uh, which uh, basically uh, gives a sort of sense of everything I own everywhere. So you have a bunch of my NFTs at the top. Uh, you have like my wallet balance, um, which is like a mix of a bunch of terrible shit coins, uh, some ETH, uh, an FWB benefit uh, membership, and that's about it. Um, and then a whole bunch of things on, on different protocols to test. 
Um, what Zephyr basically does is queries every smart contract that's out there in DeFi um, and looks up my balance um, from those contracts and adds them together. So it's like a dashboard, right? And it's fully interoperable with all the information there, including NFT data, which are URIs. Um, if you look at Snapshot, it's also interoperating. What Snapshot does is let you take governance votes. So you can look at uh, who owned what coins at what date and then give them uh, vote points or voting shares to decide to make something happen. So here's a vote on Snapshot for the Gitcoin project. Um, Snapshot basically isn't looking at the logic or anything else really on chain other than balances. It's sharing data. Um, friends with benefits, uh, instead of doing governance, like we were talking about before with Snapshot, um, explicitly in its um, membership profile, basically has gating um, with its token. So if you want the listserv or the, I think, is it a listserv or a magazine or an email chain, you need to have one FWB in your wallet. If you want to be on the Discord, you need to have 75 FWB in your wallet. So what that means is that um, there's a tool called Colab Land, and that is embedded in their Discord, and it's checking your wallet to see if you meet some minimum threshold of tokens. Now, again, that's just looking at data on chain. Um, for those who are obviously interested in games, um, that also includes playing with NFTs. So Axie is not really a decentralized game that's like on chain. What it is, is a normal Web2 game that checks to see what axes you own on chain, right? It does a, a query. Uh, and then it represents those axes with game logic uh, as its own decision, right? And that game logic isn't on chain at all. It's just a sort of set of indicators um, of what you own. Um, in this case, these three axes. Composability um, and permissionlessness, those are those are more involved ways of thinking about interoperability, right? Like composability is a, a sort of superset or uh, you, you need to be interoperable to be composable, but not vice versa. So essentially smart contracts follow standards. This is to help with interoperability and composability. So ERC-20 is has these, this list of, I think, 18 different um, functions that you expect to see the interface of the contract. There could be more, um, there shouldn't be less, um, and they should behave the way they're named, but they're not forced to, right? So you could call like get balance and it could always give you the number 20 if it wanted to. It could give you the number 50 or a thousand, like it could be a fixed variable. <laughs> that would be terrible, but it's implementable. Um, and the same for ERC 721, the standard, one of the standards for NFTs. So every other smart contract or web two app can craft messages that if correctly signed, may execute transfers of ownership. This is one example of composability, transfer tokens. Um, so here are some examples. This is my MetaMask wallet, uh, which is a Web2 app built on top of that same address we saw before. Um, there's no dark mode in MetaMask, so I'm sorry, the screen is so bright and didn't match the rest of my slide presentation. It makes me quite upset. Um, so here you can see um, that not only is there an interoperability where MetaMask can query my balance on chain, but MetaMask can also um, send or swap uh, and lots of failed transactions here, as you can see, um, assets. Now, normally it works, um, but essentially here, MetaMask has the ability to trigger functions and logic from protocols it didn't create. Right, that's what's sort of exciting here is we get to use the things other people made on chain. Um, here's an example of uh, one of those things, uh, Uniswap. Um, here with that same address connected, I can show like, a, for instance, a swap of one ETH for 287 uni, more or less. Um, what's interesting is although Uniswap was being composed with MetaMask earlier, um, even more um, deeply composed is the UNI token and the ETH token. 
So Uniswap is looking at the logic of ETH and Uni uh, and triggering logical like functions from those contracts, managing them. Uh, in this case, ETH doesn't have a contract because it's not wrapped ETH, it's actual ETH. We don't have to get into that. But Uniswap is this ERC-20 that has a whole bunch of functions and the Uniswap contract will interact with the Uniswap token or any other token for that matter. Um, OpenSea uh, will let me create um, and swap and buy NFTs on chain, right? And uh, here's where things get, I think, very interesting for game makers. Uh, this is a project I did called the Astral Colossus. Um, so we were talking about composability of the game. I play this game called Dark Forest. Uh, it's a fully on-chain game. It's very competitive. The rewards can be very valuable. Uh, it's extremely ugly. Um, and essentially, during one round of Dark Forest, which looks a lot like the game Galcon, you take over planets and send energy from planet to planet to attack them. Uh, during this game, we create a smart contract player. Essentially, uh, instead of a player normally being like a single person with an address that signs messages, we created a contract that would sign messages on its behalf uh, and that would basically score points. And the way it would work is players would contribute planets to the smart contract. The smart contract would score them using the logic of Dark Forest uh, and then give the planets back, again, using the logic of Dark Forest. And by doing that, we were able to create a permissionless um, guild, or so to speak, uh, in a game where players could safely know that they were contributing um, and there was a leaderboard and you could see how much you contributed relative to your peers and all of that would be managed right with composability. Um, uncensorable. So uh, <laughs> I'm just saying this is not legal advice, but a, a big part of all of these contracts is that they can't stop you. So if you're hacking, um, or if you're stealing IP in some ways, uh, if you're sufficiently anonymous and decentralized, there's nothing anyone can do about it. So for instance, um, Tornado Cash uh, lets you get around KYC, know your customer and AML. It just lets you sort of mix up your money with other people's and take it out. And it's fully composable on top of all those token protocols we were talking about before. Um, something like Fractionalize, Fractional.art, uh, here, what you can do is split up uh, NFTs. So here you've got an example of uh, an NFT off Zora called the Doge NFT. Um, and it was split up into 17 billion fractions. And those fractions were made liquid. Uh, and the idea here is that you can do something that is usually not allowed, um, which is turn an art asset into stocks, um, thus usually turning it into a security. Um, and normally like you could get in trouble for doing this, but if you're just building a user interface on top, you, the user interface person may not be getting in trouble for this. Um, and then going back to the games idea, what I think is pretty interesting uh, is this game called Skyweaver. Uh, I was in a cab going to ETH Denver and I was talking to one of the lead game designers and he sent me this problem that Skyweaver was having. So on a blockchain game, if it's truly decentralized and all that, it's very hard to know who's a human and who's not. Um, and it's very hard to prevent, you know, bots. So at Skyweaver, uh, we had this, this issue where lots of bots were playing in order to make money from playing the game because Skyweaver incentivizes players to play as part of the beta. Uh, and the bots um, at first were easy to stop because they just put up a CAPTCHA before playing, right? So solve the CAPTCHA, you can play, and that will end some bots. Well, let me tell you, bots are getting a whole lot smarter these days and CAPTCHAs do not stop. So the bots overtake the CAPTCHAs, and now they have their bot problem. Where to next? Well, they say, okay, the bots are pretty bad at playing the game. So bots that are bad 
um, we can just like eliminate their rewards by saying you need to be a certain amount of good to you know get rewards in the game. But then the you know programmers of those bots did some effort and made the bots better. Um, and then the bots started winning more games and being more diverse in their win percentages. Um, so they were like, okay, players are still complaining because they know who's a bot because the bots don't emote. Like the players will like, you know, taunt or do all these other, you know, funny things to get a rise out of the other opponent. It's like Hearthstone if you have ever played it. Um, and if like Hearthstone, you see your opponent not responding to anything you do, uh, maybe that's because they're a robot. And so they started flagging people who weren't emoting. Um, and then the bots all of a sudden started to emote. And today, the bots that play Skyweaver pass captures, play well, and have all the emotions you would expect a human to have. Um, and that, I think, is pretty cool because they're now passing the Turing test. The players don't know who's a human bot, who's a human, who's a bot. Um, and what that means is there's a huge amount of player liquidity. If you want to find a match, instead of waiting five minutes, you can find one instantaneously and play against what you think is a human. Uh, and so what's interesting here is the bounty, the, the payout for playing, acted as a kind of reward for a decentralized sort of hacker network to, to build an AI for the core team. And I think that's really interesting. Because the, the bug became the feature, right? They got something for what they paid for. And that, I think, is a very interesting lesson uh, in thinking about how to do this. But at the same time, Skyweaver was not an uncensorable project. They have a client and a UI that could just, like, stop people. Um, and that's a lot less interesting and exciting than... Uh, I think some of the games like Dark Forest, which you mentioned before, which are fully on chain and where the client is open source uh, and you can just like do whatever you want. So what I want to sort of jump to now um, is answer any questions if you have any. Go back to any slides if you had some, uh, if you had some questions. And then if not, um, just walk you through uh, some of my favorite project, some of my favorite moments um, in Dark Forest, which I think is like a very good place to think about composability in games and the different things that have happened in it. So there's a chat and a QA button. I don't see any questions yet, so I'm going to just like go on my adventure. Um, I'm going to just do that by doing this. And I'm going to go over here. Okay, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing screen. Here I am. And I'll turn screen share on. I'm going to share screen two. Okay. So this is um, Dark Force. They're hiring. Uh, this game was created over a year ago. Uh, and essentially, the game is played in rounds that last a certain amount of hours, uh, sometimes, you know, days, weeks. Um, here's the historical leaderboard. Um, here's the um, first and second place teams. Uh, I They're tied right now through a truce. Um, they basically uh, have been connected to Twitter. Um, which is a really cool way of using interoperability. Um, you can find out more about them here. Um, and the way the game is played um, is essentially through these smart contracts. Um, and so if you go to um, the GitHub, which I'm going to show you by changing my tab to window. What I think is very interesting about these open source games. Oh, I'm going to shrink the view. Why is this not? There we go. Um, is that the whole code is open source. So 
We're talking about true composability here because the games are fully available to look at and play with, right? Um, and the way they break it down is you have um, Dark Forest, the client. This is like the front end for playing the game. Um, and Editrix, who won version 6.1 of Dark Forest, actually made a modification to the client um, so that transactions would be parallelized instead of serialized. Um, and that's pretty cool uh, because people were incentivized to sort of improve and update um, the code of the client in order to win. Uh, you can also go to the .eth files to see this is where the smart contracts are for Dark Forest. Um, and you can start to think about um, how to alter your thoughts on how the game should be played based on the code in the smart contract, then also build smart contracts on top of it or, or plugins um, on top of it. And so here's the plugin section. This is where players build like different JavaScript tools um, to alter how the game behaves. And so if you go to plugins.zkga.me, basically the game was this planet overtaking simulator and it didn't have many features, but players decided they were gonna come in and start just adding new tooling on top of it. Um, and this new tooling could do all kinds of things like um, tell you how long a voyage is gonna take, um, tell you how, show you how to gift your entire empire to someone else. So uh, have you automatically um, build a heat map for your setup so you know where people are on the map. These are all things that didn't exist in the game, but that players built so that other players could enjoy efficiencies. For instance, it was really frustrating to always go to the leaderboard um, on the main page and not see it in game, but to be able to see it in game was this like helpful solution. Um, there's some you know, more involved things where plugins help you go to war automatically or distribute your money in more efficient ways or handle a variety of um, complex scripted logic so you don't have to make as many moves as those that exist. Um, one of the more complicated ones would be like the remote miner. So in Dark Forest, the game is played in zero knowledge, um, which is basically to say that you're playing chess blind. So you can see your pieces, you can't see your opponent's pieces, and they make moves and submit proofs saying that they made a correct move, just not where. Um, and that's a remarkably new like gameplay mechanic that's not really available to normal web tube designers um, to do it permissionlessly. So like sure in web two, you can like create a fog of war. Um, you can like tell your players, hey, you can't see your opponent, but the, the game developer knows where everything is. Um, what's interesting about Dark Forest is even the game developers don't know what the map is. Only the players know the map locally where they are um, and can reveal it. But even then it's hard to prove that you've revealed the correct map. Um, and to reveal the map, you need to use your graphics card to do a lot of like hashing. Uh, and this remote mining uh, plugin is somewhere here, which basically lets you um, use graphics cards from far away to help you um, hash out your map and figure out what the fog of war is. So yeah, players are building all these fun tools, sharing them with each other. And then what the game designers are doing is rewarding them for interoperating. Um, so what that means is like every round, um, players... Um, get NFTs for winning um, and they get NFTs for building. So for 63rd place, Cream PP123 got this tiny planet. And as we scroll up, the planets get bigger and nicer and rarer. Um, and here's where my DAO came second and we were first for a little while, but got ultimately defeated by um, Orden, who we'll talk about later. But here, Manan was in our DAO um, and Valorn was in our DAO and, you know, Zurich bears a friend, maybe he's in our DAO now. 
Um, you know, all these plants here were special mention plants for people who built cool plugins, basically, for people who contributed to the game. And then Ghost GG, also known as Orden GG, our competitor, won the main plant. Um, what I want to talk about as part of composability then is to think about rewards. So once you make your game fully open, once all the code is open, um, what incentivizes people to build on it, right? This has always been the question with NFTs. If you build NFTs um, that you hope other people are going to use in their games, or if you build games that you hope other people are going to build on top of, in the case of composability and logic, you need to like think, well, they're not stupid, these other builders. They, they want to build for a reason. So either you make it crazy fun and they build for free. And this is the way you see things with um, Little Big Planet or Skyrim modding or Minecraft or Roblox. Um, or, or you find a way to share in the spoils. Now, Dark Force has no token and it has no revenue. Um, one day it might. Um, in the meanwhile, um, players are receiving these planets as tokens of appreciation. Um, and so these planets act as a kind of incentive mechanism to build in, in the way that the you know tokens for Skyweaver act as incentive for the hackers to hack. Um, and so when thinking about composable games, I just want to add that there's always needs to be this incentive design around them, right? And thinking about why you're making composable games. So some other things to note when making truly composable games is that they don't scale um, if they're going to be on chain. And if they're not going to be on chain, they're really not going to be very composable. So um, Dark Forest had 612 players this round. Um, it took up the majority of the Gnosis chain, which is an Ethereum side chain that has more transactions than Ethereum. Um, essentially, each player was making thousands of moves, um, meaning this is unplayable on any mainnet, right? If we're going to have composable games going forward, they're going to need to be on their own chains. They're going to need to be rolled up. They're going to need to have logic separated. Uh, and it's going to take some time um, before you can imagine mass player adoption and maybe never actually like the the problem with blockchains is they're bad at scaling and so for the most part we're going to see just interoperable games games that are truly web 2 in nature and query the on-chain data for uh information right the way axie behaves um and the sad part about that is the game state isn't shared, right? There's no way to sort of guarantee that it's fair. There's no way to guarantee that you can build on it, build on it forever. Um, and so I don't want to go out and say like composable games are the solution to all of Web 2's problems. Um, a composable game like Dark Forest uh, is really meant for like a niche number of players uh, who are total nerds like that are geeking out and building scripts and coding and, and growing the game together. Uh, now, it's possible you could make a centralized version of Dark Forest once these, you know, nerds are done building it up to being this, like, excellent and super usable game, but unlikely. Um, great. I got a question from Scott. Is Ronan leading the side chain for gaming movement, or is this more multi-chain? So, currently, Axie, right, is built on Ronan. Um, the Ronan uh, chain is very closed down. So if you want to, uh, if you want to use Ronin, um, let me go here. Ronin Builders Program, right? Um, so Ronin recently announced that they're doing a builders program to recruit people to start building apps and apps on Ronin, um, but it's very uh, hard to get into the program. They have tons of applications. Um, the way the network currently works is there are no transaction fees, uh, which means like it can't be truly decentralized yet. They're working towards there. Um, and so I would say that Ronin is doing a great job at scaling and letting 
Axie players, you know, keep control of their Axies on chain, but none of the game data is on that chain, just the balance of the tokens in the NFT. Um, so, and, and, and they couldn't put all the game data on the NFT, on the chain. There's way too much player activity to like store every move on chain. Um, so what that means is if you are going to see um, games go fully on chain, even like Ronin, you should expect roll-ups on top of Ronin. So either zero knowledge roll-ups or optimistic roll-ups um, that are going to sort of segment games um, in their own ecosystems. And what that means is actually they're going to lose a lot of their composability with other things. So right now, like Dark Forest could theoretically connect to Uniswap if it was on Gnosis or Aave um, and use all these really interesting DeFi protocols because they're all smart contracts that can all talk to each other. But as soon as you start, you know, sticking games on their own side chains or their own rollups, um, you end up with this, um, this loss of composability and you have to redeploy contracts, but without liquidity on them. So... To and and just for those who don't know the difference, uh, a side chain is usually a chain that has forked um, the virtual machine logic of another blockchain. So in this case, Ronin is a fork of Ethereum, uh, and then has a bridge, um, but has its own consensus. So what that means is like Ronin does not inherit the security of Ethereum, but it has a way to move assets between the two. Um, either chain could fail independently, um, and that would cause catastrophic problems um, to the other chain as the bridge would be compromised. Um, when you have a rollup, um, a rollup sits on top of a chain. Um, so, for instance, like a rollup like Optimism, um, you can bridge assets up. The rollup looks exactly like a blockchain in structure, um, but it inherits the consensus of the chain that it's on top of. So that means that um, if there's a 51% attack uh, on Ethereum, the rollup up here suffers. But if there's a 51% attack on this thing, it doesn't matter. Like assets can just go back to Ethereum safely. So there's a, an, an inheritance there that's really nice for rollups and why most people prefer rollups to sidechains. Um, could composability become more accessible to non-dev players? So... The answer I think is, is sort of yes and no. I think players are becoming more uh, developer savvy over time. Uh, I think people are becoming more used to technology over time. You know, if you think about the kind of technology that was in the hands and pockets of people 30 years ago versus today, like in order to keep up, you just need to get better at it. Um, and I suspect that even like, so that if someone was going to build like no code tooling for players to start composing, that would be cool, but I've never seen it. Um, so the the closest you can get is sort of like the Dark Forest plugins. So I wasn't like a JavaScript expert by any means, but I was able to open up a plugin. The code was like in the game and I could just see like like with some help, sort of piece through reading which variables meant what, and I could be like, okay, I don't want to attack plants less than level three. I want to attack plants less than level four. I change a three for a four and we're done, right? Um, that kind of interactive composability can happen, but I don't think anything meaningful um, will happen outside of that. That said, Dark Forest DAO, the DAO that plays Dark Forest that I, I work with, um, has a lot of non-technical people in it because like a company almost, like they're engineers, but there's also, you know, public speakers and writers um, and there are administrators and community managers. And if you look at Dark Forest, it reminds me a lot of the Simpsons quote where um, this general who's like doing a commencement address, I think Lisa's like imaginary graduation in the future says, um, the wars of the future will not be fought on land and sea, but in space or possibly on the top of a very tall mountain. And they will not be fought by people, but by robots. Um, and it will be your job to build and maintain those robots. And this is what we're sort of seeing in Dark Forest, where on a blockchain that's permissionless, eventually it makes no sense for a human to make moves. 
um, it, it makes sense for a robot or an AI to make moves. And the player community is there to like pit one AI or, or bot against another and to support it and to get, you know, devs for it and to like grow it into its own thing. Um, because that's what permissionless, composable, interoperable, uncensorable gameplay leads to, which is totally different from like how normal people think about game design. Um, and I think maybe even too cutting edge to make any sense. The only thing that sort of keeps me, mm, I guess, warm in my heart or like safe at night is thinking about this quote that says, and I forget who says, I think it's Sam Altman, but I could be wrong. It's like, look what nerds are doing on the weekends. And that's what everybody will be doing on the weekdays 10 years from now. And so nerds are definitely playing Dark Force on the weekend. And somehow that means that in 10 years, everyone's going to be playing Dark Force on the weekdays in the future. So I don't know how, but that'll happen some point. Um, and Scott has a team in the Sky Mavis Builder Program. That's great. Yeah, because hard to get in. So getting in means like you must have done something right. Um, from from Thib, I guess that's short for like Cebu or something. Um, what are the best resources to learn more about composability? Do you think it is the killer feature of Web3? So composability is definitely the killer feature of Web3 um, because it's wrapped into censorship resistance um, and open source code. So one of the best things about Web3 is we found a way to make open source able to capture value. It's like the Uniswap code was open source and it captured value. Even after the sushi fork, like stole that code, redeployed it and made its own value too. Um, and Uniswap is built on by many other contracts. Um, because it's open source and composable and the entire DeFi stack um, of permissionless, open source, interoperable, composable um, technology is what's enabled it to accelerate in two years and do what like the financial sector took like way longer to build. Um, so definitely think that's awesome. My worry is that it's very hard for games as we know them to take advantage of composability. Uh, it, it means that players behave in very different ways and thinking about problems very differently and the games are structured very differently. Um, Justin asks, how big will become Dark Forest? Is still worth joining now. So from my perspective, one of there are only a handful of interesting Web3 games and by far the most interesting is Dark Forest to me. Um, I, I think that it's extremely early. There's still no token, for instance, um, if there ever will be one. Uh, and the game still looks like, you know, but um, at the, so I would say like, try it, try and do it, join. Um, and you can, uh, you can easily get in through Dark Forest DAO, um, which ha usually has a lot of uh, whitelist keys available. Um, it's really hard to get a whitelist key otherwise. Um, you can go to the main forums or whatever. But if you're a dev who's looking to learn or get into it, um, Dark Forest DAO uh, hosts like learning rounds every once in a while and community rounds um, and might even be stress testing a deployment of optimism at some point on, on Gnosis, um, which would be really cool. So you can think about like Web3 gaming as a service to stress test new blockchains or, uh, you know, Web3 gaming as a service to teach new developers how to come into Web3, which is very different like use case for games than what has historically been the case, right? We don't think of games as ways to stress test things. And we don't think of games as ways to train new developers, but that seems to be what Dark Forest is more suited to do than say, um, you know, entertain a million people simultaneously. Um, maybe it could be an eSport and you could entertain them with like broadcasting. Um, that's not to say that like, Web3 games with their NFTs can't like scale because like moving NFTs from one owner to another, that's not a big deal. It's the composable part where the blockchain state is on chain and where every move you make that changes the game state has to be made on chain. So either 
players in this game that you're trying to make, if it's trying to be a composable game, don't make a lot of moves, or they can make a lot of moves, but then commit them in one batch or a delta at a certain point on chain, and therefore they don't make that many moves. Um, I think a good frame of reference is to think of board games. So some of the best European board games, like the winners of the Spiel des Jahres, um, have players only make a handful of moves in a round, maybe like 40 decisions to make in a game. And like, if you know, if you're playing Dota, you can make 40 decisions under one minute. But a Euro game, like a nice strategic Euro game, or like even chess, if you think about it, only 40 moves to make for like two hours, potentially. Um, that does scale way better. Um, and so then you need to ask yourself, why would you want to make, you know, games on chain? Um, generally when I'm talking to startups or founders who are making games in the space, I'm telling them that you need to have an additional motive to make your game. So if you look at Axie, it's a great example. Axie made an on-chain game, sort of. I mean, part of the game is on chain. Um, but what it really did was onboard millions of players to its own blockchain where it has its own decentralized exchange and probably at some point its own lending platform. And what that means is Axie's value isn't just the game, but the potential future of the blockchain being able to um, capture tons of value by banking the unbanked. Something like 25% of Axie's players aren't banked, which means that Ronan gets to bank them. And let me tell you, it's a hell of a lot more profitable being someone's, you know, only financial institution <laughs> than it is to be their video game. Uh, and so uh, another example is Steppen, which right now is doing very well on Solana. It's a move to earn game, but it's trying to build a social network, right? And it's going to capture people on the social side. So, you know, just just sort of want to point out that if your Web3 game isn't going to capture financial or other like benefits of the Web3 space in a really meaningful way, it's probably going to just be so hampered by the friction of Web3 um, so, uh, that, that, that you won't be able to make much progress. Um, Hotspur asked a question. I'll go to Alvin in a second. Uh, I don't get the bank, the unbank. They have to go through the CEX bank account to take the money out, right? So um, it's funny. It's like that quote from The Matrix where Neo's like, uh, blah, 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 blah. And Morpheus is like, no, Neo. Like what I'm saying is in time, you won't have to. Right. He's like, I can I can stop bullets or I can dodge bullets. And then Morpheus is like, no, in time you won't have to. So the way this relates to what you're saying is um, I'm an Axie player in the Philippines. A guild recruits me to play. Um, I get their scholarship. I get paid an SLP. I convert that SLP to USDC. Um, and I have my mobile phone wallet app. Um, I can sure go try and convert that um with uh but i don't need i don't need a bank account to convert that in fact a bank won't even accept usdc usually uh in the philippines what instead is if i need to buy something someone else will eventually take my usdc off my hands because they can use it um uh or like we sort of circumvent all money generally we just use crypto for payments on ronin right that's the promise of ronin is to never even use fiat at the end of the day in the first place um so it's not truly like banking the unbanked because you don't have the benefits of like, you know, payments uh, right away. But there are lots of like upcoming credit card companies that are going to let you use collateral on chain to spend from your credit card and then just pay your debt from the collateral on chain. So there you can just start seeing like a whole new financial stack emerging that's based on the blockchain layer and the assets that are held there. I hope that kind of answers the question. So it's like, it's not a perfect banking, um, but at the same time, like in a few years, it won't matter because the banking ins institutions will be sort of rerouted by alternative institutions that can use your on-chain assets. And then Alvin asks, will it be possible to have interoperability 
across different chains. So interoperability across different chains is very possible. Um, so there are all kinds of ways uh, that you can do that, um, but messaging bridges is the number one way. So like wormhole or dbridge, um, no, these kinds of bridges have the capacity to send a message across. Think of it like an oracle. You have some decentralized oracle that can read on one chain and get paid by the other chain for the message that it finds. Um, what you can't really have is composability um, uh, that's atomic across chains. So you can have a, a bridge swap assets from one chain to another and then use those assets over here. But you can't in one transaction ask that a bridge do something, move an asset, that asset changes and comes back and does something here and then go. Like um, there's, they're too asynchronous to have true composability there. Um, Mario asks, how do you think crypto and FinTech will relate? Which one will benefit the unbanked the most? Um, I think that we're seeing novel fintech projects adopt crypto more and more. Um, fintech uh, is usually, uh, you know, building centralized solutions. Um, but right now, those centralized solutions are leveraging um, the benefits that crypto brings. At the same time, um, like the, the difference between crypto and fintech is getting blurry, right? Like all crypto is theoretically fintech to some degree. Um, it's just a question of regulation. I, I personally don't follow the, like the, the cutting edge of like what neobanks are doing, like in the global South. So I have no idea, like who's in the lead there, what's going to happen. Um, but certainly something to watch out for, um, in the far future, the the thought is that we'll have probably a good thick layer of crypto like ledgers and then a bunch of fintech sort of web apps or apps that just like call to the blockchain to make movements and changes and like no fintech will hopefully have its own like ledger that it keeps like people's balances on um except as a way to scale the underlying blockchain um, if that makes sense. So if you think of Coinbase, it's like one of the best scaling solutions for blockchains because it takes those assets out of circulation, escrows them in its own wallets, and then lets people trade infinitely with, you know, without clogging the blockchain and then just settles um, when it's done. The problem with Coinbase and any centralized exchange is that it can be frozen by a government, right? That's the sort of ethos of Web3 is that if something is centralized, it can be censored because a government can put pressure on that entity to change the rules around how the crypto works. Um, so that's why all previous attempts at building money before Bitcoin failed because they weren't sufficiently decentralized. Um, and so like Bitcoin's fundamental ethos, the fundamental use case um, to be frank, is terrorist financing, right? It, or uh, said another way, like revolution financing, or said another way, like fight evil dictatorial governments, right? The the thought is that the worst case scenario for the world from like the libertarian perspective, which is not mine, um, but is a fine one, I guess, is that um, if you get a government that's so strong and powerful, that it eventually is capable of freezing all your credit cards and surveilling everyone and freezing your banks, there's no way to resist it. It becomes too strong uh, in a fully mediated online age. Um, and so Bitcoin was this like promised release valve, right? This place to say, hey, even in the worst possible case where a government controls everything, they can't control Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin could be your tool to resist that government. Um, all of Web3 sort of stems from that premise. Now, in Ethereum trying to make uncensorable smart contracts, it was trying to just take that Bitcoin idea further. Um, Vitalik, in fact, created Ethereum uh, supposedly because he was upset that 
Blizzard nerfed life drain on his warlock in World of Warcraft. Um, and so he's like, a centralized entity should not be able to nerf my favorite spell and ruin the game I spent hours on um, in this way. I'll go build like the world computer to stop them. That's sort of like what the apocryphal story is. Um, but we don't, you know, um, it doesn't scale. Right. So it's not meant it's not it was never meant to make games to this degree. Right. So when you decide to put games on chain, you have to be very careful about it because often it's going to be a, either a bad idea or it's profitable because it's basically illegal. And so you're basically um, benefiting from regulatory arbitrage, which is pretty sketchy. Uh, an example is like Robin Hood. Robinhood is this really popular trading app in the United States. You can buy and sell stocks. They're currently in trouble because they put like fireworks when you buy the stocks. And the whole point about finance is you're supposed to be in, in regulated countries, you're supposed to be very sober about it. You're not supposed to make financial decisions when you aren't like fully cognizant of what it means to be making those decisions. And by adding bells and whistles to buying things, you kind of incentivize people a little bit to buy and sell more, to make more money. And that's not good for people, right? Crypto, on the other hand, like you can build entire video games about making terrible financial decisions, right? Like you want apples in your apple orchard, buy some apple stock. You want, you know, uh, to drive a Tesla in your video game, buy some Tesla stock. Like we're able now to do things, um, in games that affect people's finances in very dangerous ways that are hard to regulate. Um, and I'm sure gonna be extremely profitable. Um, and so that's like one reason people are making these kinds of games. Um, Pratyush asks, when and how do you think we will achieve widespread adoption of blockchain? Um, I don't know what, I, I, I don't know when, and I don't know what it will look like um, and I don't know how much room there is, certainly more room than there is now, certainly more room to grow. Um, at, to some degree, we've, we've, we've got pretty widespread adoption now. Like we have, you know, hundreds of millions, if not a, a billion people who like touch crypto by now. So, um, you know, we're all already well on the way. Uh, the question is like, when will, for me, the question is, when will we like find all the really good use cases for crypto, right? Um, because the majority of use cases people have found or are selling are just like a waste of time. Like just build that in web two. Like it's way, like you're so hobbled making things in, in crypto that you don't really want to make blockchain products unless you have an extremely good thesis or reason to make it on the blockchain, right? Like you have a very clear reason why you can't make it anywhere else. Um, and, you know, the reason that people currently have is like, well, it's a buzzword and I can get more funding if I do it this way. Well, that's a really sad reason and it happens to be a, one that works, but I'm, I'm sort of don't think that's sustainable long-term. Like you can't keep delivering projects that are based on like a fundamental flaw and reason. Okay, um, I think we've come to time. Uh, I had a great time uh, chatting with you all. Uh, thanks for all the questions. Really appreciate it. I hope the presentation was useful to you. Um, and if you do have feedback for me, um, please follow me at uh, Danger Will Robin on Twitter. Here, I'll type it here. Uh, and, and then you can just DM me if you have any questions or if you thought uh, some things were stupid, you can just directly tell me. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is the first of like a, a new series of I'm trying to like build out um, and I'll be talking at game developer conference in a month. So I need to make sure I got a good presentation for them. Uh, have a great time, everybody. And, and thanks for the thanks.